Forward to the Gods of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. The Gods of Mars. Forward. Twelve years had passed since I had laid the body of my great uncle, Captain John Carter of Virginia, away from the sight of men in that strange mausoleum in the old cemetery at Richmond. Often had I pondered on the odd instructions he had left me governing the construction of his mighty tomb, and especially those parts which directed that he be laid in an open casket, and that the ponderous mechanism which controlled the bolts of the vault's huge door be accessible only from the inside. Twelve years had passed since I had read the remarkable manuscript of this remarkable man. This man, who remembered no childhood, and who could not even offer a vague guess as to his age, who was always young, and yet who had dandled my grandfather's great-grandfather upon his knee this man who had spent ten years upon the planet Mars, who had fought for the green men of Barsoom and fought against them, who had fought for and against the red men and who had won the ever-beautiful Dejah Thoris, princess of Helium, for his wife, and for nearly ten years had been a prince of the house of Tardos Mors, Jeddak of Helium. Twelve years had passed since his body had been found on the bluff before his cottage overlooking the Hudson, and oft times during these long years I had wondered if John Carter were really dead, or if he again roamed the dead sea bottoms of that dying planet. If he had returned to Barsoom to find that he had opened the frowning portals of the mighty atmosphere plant in time to save the countless millions who were dying of asphyxiation on that far-gone day, that had seen him hurtle ruthlessly through forty-eight million miles of space back to earth once more. I had wondered if he had found his black-haired princess and the slender son he had dreamed was with her in the royal gardens of Tardos Moors, awaiting his return. Or had he found that he had been too late, and thus gone back to a living death upon a dead world? Or was he really dead after all? never to return either to his mother Earth or his beloved Mars. Thus was I lost in useless speculation one sultry August evening, when old Ben, my body-servant, handed me a telegram. Tearing it open, I read, Meet me tomorrow, Hotel Raleigh, Richmond. John Carter. Early the next morning I took the first train for Richmond, and within two hours was being ushered into the room occupied by John Carter. As I entered he rose to greet me, his old-time cordial smile of welcome lighting his handsome face. Apparently he had not aged a minute, but was still the straight, clean-limbed fighting man of thirty. His keen gray eyes were undimmed, and the only lines upon his face were the lines of iron character and determination that always had been there since I first remembered him nearly thirty-five years before. "'Well, nephew,' he greeted me, "'do you feel as though you were seeing a ghost, or suffering from the effects of too many of Uncle Ben's juleps?' "'Juleps, I reckon,' I replied, "'for I certainly feel mighty good, but maybe it's just the sight of you again that affects me. You have been back to Mars? Tell me.' And Dejah Thoris, you found her well and awaiting you? Yes, I have been to Barsoom again. And, but it's a long story, too long to tell in the limited time I have before I must return. I have learned the secret, nephew, and I may traverse the trackless void at my will, coming and going between the countless planets as I list. But my heart is always in Barsoom and while it is there in the keeping of my Martian princess, I doubt that I shall ever again leave the dying world that is my life. I have come now because my affection for you prompted me to see you once more before you pass over forever into that other life that I shall never know, and which, though I have died thrice and shall die again tonight, as you know death, I am as unable to fathom as are you." Even the wise and mysterious therns of Barsoom, that ancient cult which, for countless ages, 
has been credited with holding the secret of life and death in their impregnable fastnesses upon the hither slopes of the mountains of Utz, are as ignorant as we. I have proved it, though I near lost my life in the doing of it. But you shall read it all in the notes I have been making during the last three months that I have been back upon earth. He patted a swelling portfolio that lay on the table at his elbow. I know that you are interested and that you believe, and I know that the world too is interested, though they will not believe for many years, yes, for many ages, since they cannot understand. Earthmen have not yet progressed to a point where they can comprehend the things that I have written in those notes. Give them what you wish of it, what you think will not harm them, but do not feel aggrieved if they laugh at you. That night I walked down to the cemetery with him. At the door of his vault he turned and pressed my hand. "'Good-bye, nephew,' he said. "'I may never see you again, for I doubt that I can ever bring myself to leave my wife and boy while they live, and the span of life upon Barsoom is often more than a thousand years.' He entered the vault. The great door swung slowly, too. The ponderous bolts grated into place. The lock clicked. I have never seen Captain John Carter of Virginia since. But here is the story of his return to Mars on that other occasion, as I have gleaned it from the great mass of notes which he left for me upon the table of his room in the hotel at Richmond. There is much which I have left out, much which I have not dared to tell, but you will find the story of his second search for Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium, even more remarkable than was his first manuscript which I gave to an unbelieving world a short time since, and through which we followed the fighting Virginian across dead sea-bottoms under the moons of Mars. E.R.B. End of Forward <laughs>